Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You can read the first chapter of many books featured on Book Notes by visiting C-SPAN's home page on the World Wide Web at lowercase www.cspan.org. To order a video copy of this program, please call 1-800-C-SPAN-98. And Sunday on Book Notes, former CBS News correspondent Charles Corralt discusses his recent book, Charles Corralt's America. Book Notes, Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. Here's a speech by MIT professor Noam Chomsky. For the next two hours, he talks about international economic issues and policies. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of CAQ, Covert Action Quarterly. I'm Terry Allen. I'm editor of Covert Action Quarterly. Um, the hearing impaired in, within the loop, if you want to set your hearing aids to the T setting, uh, that will work well with the loop. I want to thank a few people before we start for their uh, contributions to, the, to tonight. Skewer's Restaurant at P and 17th Street provided the food for the reception. Uh, several area bookstores were kind enough to allow their stores to be used for ticket sales. Vertigo's, Politics and Prose, Chuck and Dave's, Alphaville, the Bethesda Co-op um, also helped. Pam Gregory is our sign language interpreter uh, who is here tonight. Um, and uh, all the volunteers who work so hard to help us and make this so... I, th I think the, the lights are for the, s the sign language interpreter. She needs to have those so that people can see. <laughs> Is there any way that those can be fixed so that they're not shining directly on people? Um, yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's the, the hearing impaired people need that so that they can see the sign interpreter. So if you can... Okay, they're gonna they're gonna see what they can do. So if you can if you can, while <laughs> we'll do what we can. Listen, you don't want to see me, so just listen. And by the time Professor Chomsky gets on, we'll try and do something for them. Okay, you don't have to see me. It's okay. All right. <laughs> People rule, the lights are going off. All right. <laughs> okay, well, I was next going to thank you all for coming. <laughs> I still will. Um, <laughs> um, thank you all for coming to this benefit for CAQ. Uh, your presence here, and I know some people have come from as far away as Canada and the Midwest will help CAQ continue 17 years of publishing hard-hitting investigative journalism and analysis. I encourage you to pick up copies of the magazine in the lobby and to subscribe tonight. Some of the best activists, thinkers, and writers in this country have appeared and internationally have appeared on the pages of CAQ. None more important in fueling the fires of dissent, reason, and compassion than Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky has always supported the alternative media and has challenged the assumptions and agenda of the corporate press. When CAQ started making plans for his visit, we thought it would be interesting and useful to go to the National Press Club and ask them if they would like to have him as a speaker at the National Press Club luncheon. Now, the National Press Club considers itself the elite organization of the press, 
Uh, they know, they feel that they are in touch with what news is and who makes it. Nevertheless, I was less than confident that they would welcome Noam Chomsky with open arms, despite his position as one of the most well-known, renowned, and Im influential thinkers in the world. So the first man I talked to as I wended my way up the press club bureaucracy actually sounded mildly enthusiastic. I explained to him that Professor Chomsky was one of the country's foremost critics of U.S. policy. No problem, he said. We have critics of U.S. foreign policy here all the time. Why, just this, this year, the press club has hosted Phil Graham, Newt Gingrich, and Ross Perot. He suggested that I talk to the president of the club. When I called the president of the club, he sounded a little, a little tentative. I asked if he knew who Noam Chomsky was, and he said, of course. Would you be interested in having him for a speaker? Yes, he said, and I'm quoting now. He might be someone we'd like to have. Why don't you submit some information on him, and we'll take a look. But be sure to include a topic, and I'd just like to say, how can I put this? The topic should be something au courant. Well, I thought he probably meant the talk should have a news angle, should center around the Newtonian revolution in Congress, the growing media consolidation, the despicable coziness of the press to those in power, maybe even the anniversary of the invasion of East Timor, something like that. Sure, I said to him, you mean a news hook? The, the, the press club president agreed, yeah, but he should be prepared with a real topic. You know, we haven't had great experiences with people from the literary, cultural, entertainment fields lately. <laughs> he might just have caused my ga caught my gasp of horror because he quickly went on to say, you know, and again I'm quoting, and he said in one of those just between you and me voices, just a few weeks ago we had Jerry Lewis, and how can I say this? He wasn't really prepared. In fact, he just pattered for an hour. He didn't really have a topic. You know, he could have talked about new developments on Broadway or something, but he was all over. So we don't want that to happen again. <laughs> well, I'm sure none of you will be disappointed to hear that our speaker tonight is no Jerry Lewis. And as for his being au courant, he's something far more important than that. Noam Chomsky is relevant. He's relevant to hundreds of thousands of activists, human right wor rights workers, scholars, researchers around the world. And he is relevant to the lives of anyone who faces oppression by a government or a society in which, unjust, in which there is unjust distribution of rights, wealth, power, and opportunity. In a sense, Professor Chomsky, a scholar, an activist, a lucid and courageous thinker, is doing the job of the mainstream press, what I.F. Stone described as the miss mission of the press, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And he has also been an inspiration to action. More than anyone I can think of, Professor Chomsky has pushed people from undangerous liberalism into a radical understanding of how the world works and in whose interest it functions. In this, he is a dangerous man who threatens the vested interests. And in this, he is unlike liberals, who, as uh, singer-songwriter Phil Oakes described them, are 10 degrees to the left of center in good times, 10 degrees to the right of center when it affects them personally. Now is a time when increasing numbers of us are being affected personally by a disastrous system that runs roughshod all over the globe. Noam Chomsky is an inspiration to all of us who are determined to fight back. On behalf of the CAQ staff, Barbara Neuwirth, Phil Smith, Lou Wolf, our generous supporters, our flawless proofreaders, and all of you, I take great pleasure in welcoming Noam Chomsky. Sorry, uh, Terry didn't tell me that story about the National Press Club. I could have uh, uh, worn my one good tie, uh, which I got from the National Press Club in Australia a couple of months ago when I was asked to deliver a talk there at the 
Parliament building very harshly critical of Australian foreign policy, as I was happy to do. Uh, and I even got a nice tie for it. <laughs> well, uh, I'm here for, uh, in Washington for two talks, uh, one tonight, one tomorrow morning. Uh, neither of them came with a title, uh, so uh, I had to make some decision, and one natural choice seemed to be to pick one uh, to focus on the international arena and another one on the domestic scene, and I thought I'd start tonight with the international arena. Uh, the two are closely linked, of course, uh, even more so than in the past, as the uh, globalization of the economy and the uh, interconnection of the global system increases. Well, uh, in the international arena, uh, just to get it out of the way, uh, there is a conventional view. The conventional view is that in international affairs, uh, U.S. policy for since the Second World War has been uh, shaped by uh, the Cold War, uh, the United that is, by the need to defend the security of the United States and the world against the threat of aggressive communism. Uh, now that's finally over, uh, so there's a new era of great opportunity opening. Uh, this was uh, articulated uh, uh, very lucidly by the Clinton administration's leading intellectual, the National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, a couple of years ago, uh, outlining the Clinton Doctrine, as it came to be called. Uh, he said, throughout the Cold War, uh, we contained a global threat to market democracies. Now we should seek to enlarge their reach. And he went on to say that there's no longer any barrier to our extending to the whole world, uh, what he called the enduring truths about our own history and the constant face of everything we have ever done, namely our dedication to tolerant societies in which governments do not abuse people. Uh, and uh, the most fundamental of the enduring truths is, still quoting, of course, we do not seek to expand the reach of our own institutions by force, subversion, or repression, but rather, alone in history, we've always kept to persuasion, compassion, and other peaceful means. And commentators were much impressed by this enlightened vision of the move from containment to enlargement, and by this very persuasive uh, rendition of the enduring truths of history, although it's true that some were concerned, afraid that uh, we might go too far in our uh, traditional altruism and benevolence. Henry Kissinger was one uh, who urged that we also pay some attention to, on the side to our own interests and needs instead of just dedicating ourselves wholeheartedly to the service in the service of others as we've traditionally done and will now do throughout the world. Uh, well, uh, I should add that it's not the, uh, there were similar refrains sung in the uh, client states. So, for example, the prestigious uh, Institute for International Institute of Strategic Studies in London, uh, in its 1989 review of world affairs, explained that during the Cold War in the United States, the principles of democracy and commitment to human rights and free markets were distorted by or subordinated to the need to contain a Soviet threat, but with the Cold War ending, the United States will be free to see the problems of the world's impoverished nations, uh, their critical debt burden, their fragile political processes and related human rights violations uh, in their own terms rather than through the East-West prism. So, in other words, the U.S. will now at last be free to show its constant face and to act in accordance with the enduring truths uh, for the first time in history. Well, I'll spare you any further rhetoric, and I won't insult your intelligence by comparing the enduring truths to the facts, although it is a useful uh, and enlightening exercise. It's one that would be undertaken uh, routinely in free societies, maybe taught in elementary schools. Uh, well, 
let's turn to the present situation now that we're free to see the problems of the world without the shackles of the Cold War and to show our constant face without Cold War distortions. In particular, we're now able to see the problems of the world's impoverished nations. Accordingly, uh, Washington has uh, announced further cuts in its foreign aid, which is an international scandal. It's the most miserly in the developed world, and it would be virtually invisible uh, if we were to remove the biggest component, uh, which goes to a very rich country, uh, Israel, and that incidentally stays high uh, and unchanged. Uh, uh, it also happens, incidentally, to be the component of the foreign aid budget that's most opposed, most strongly opposed by the public. Uh, side comment. Uh, in general, public opinion and policy are not very well correlated. There are usually pretty substantial differences between them. But the current period is marked by an astonishing this difference. It's become a real chasm. Uh, I doubt if there's a period in history when the divergence between public opinion, which is well known from many attitude studies, between public opinion and policy has been so dramatic and so marked as in the present period. That's one indication of the deterioration of functioning democracy that's a very marked and striking uh, feature of the contemporary era here dramatically and to some extent in other places. Uh, well, the current Congress has cut further the ridiculously low aid budget, uh, leaving intact only one component, aid to Israel and Egypt, which is about the same thing, Egypt, because of its relation to Israel. Uh, that now amounts to 40% of the total. Uh, however, there's a one-third cut in aid for education, health care, family planning, and environmental protection in poor nations, and a 40% cut just announced in U.S. Uh, contribution to low-interest loans to poor countries through the World Bank. Uh, that's all because we are now free to uh, uh, view the problems of impoverished nations without the distortion of the Cold War. Uh, that's only part of the story. The United States is always, al also busy continuing, in fact, uh, escalating its dismantling of the more democratic aspects of the United Nations. Uh, it's recently uh, announced that it's going to cut probably terminate its contribution to the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. The uh, FAO, Food, Food and Agriculture Organization, is on the way out. The International Labor Organization is not likely to survive very long, uh, for one thing because it committed a rather serious transgression a couple of years ago. Uh, it departed from its usual practice. It almost never criticizes one of the rich, its rich donors, but it did condemned the United States a couple of years for its severe violations of, uh, of international labor conventions by permitting the hiring of uh, permanent replacement workers to break strikes, and that's a crime for which you don't, uh, uh, you, know, you have to have uh, proper retribution, so they're probably on the way out. Uh, incidentally, the United States has the worst third, work, to be precise, the third worst record in Europe and uh, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in uh, accepting uh, international labor conventions. Uh, uh, there are two worse, uh, Lithuania and El Salvador, so we're not at the bottom. Uh, but in any event, there's good reasons for the ILO to go. One can understand Jesse Helm. Uh, they're all headed for uh, extinction uh, because the U.S. refuses to pay its legally required uh, uh, funding for them. Uh, UNCTAD is also on the way out. UNCTAD provides expert economic analysis about the international scene, but it happens to conflict with the IMF World Bank orthodoxy and often to undermine it, so that has to go. Uh, the UN did have uh, an, uh, 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 a, a group which monitored and provided data about transnational corporations. In fact, it was about the only source of such information. That's already dead. Uh, and in fact, quite generally, uh, any part of the United Nations that serves the interests of people and not investors uh, is on its way out 
uh, because we are now free to show our constant face and to live by the enduring truths without the distortions of uh, the Cold War. Uh, well, the same reasons explain, let's go back to our other, the other, remember we weren't able to view human rights violations in their own right because of the Cold War distortions, but now we can do it. Uh, so take, say, this hemisphere, uh, where the prize for human rights violations is currently held by Colombia, uh, which gets about half of all U.S. military aid and training for the hemisphere on pretexts that are too ludicrous to discuss. Uh, increasing under uh, President Clinton and incidentally extending a correlation which has been rather close for many years between torture and uh, U.S. aid as demonstrated in a number of studies. Uh, the same reasons explain the warm welcome a few weeks ago for uh, General Suharto of Indonesia. He's a really world-class killer and torturer, greatly beloved in the West. Uh, Suharto is our kind of guy, a high administration official told the press when he was here. Uh, despite the uh, hundreds of thousands of corpses, uh, Su uh, uh, Suharto is at heart benign, the London economist explained. Uh, so therefore he can probably thinking of his attitude to foreign corporations, which indeed is uh, very benign. Uh, he can therefore join the long list of our kinds of guys, the uh, Brazilian and Argentine neo-Nazi generals, uh, uh, General Chun of South Korea to mention one who's recently in the news, Ceausescu of Romania, who was a particular favorite, uh, Mobutu of Zaire, uh, Somoza, and a whole host of Latin American monsters, uh, Saddam Hussein, great friend and ally, uh, and in earlier days, uh, Mussolini, uh, Hitler, Stalin. Stalin was particularly admired by Truman, Truman and Churchill, as we now know from released internal records, and too many others to mention. Uh, this was when we were uh, living the enduring truths. Uh, I'll put aside some local talent along the way. Uh, well, uh, it's in a way unfair to review and I therefore will stop to continue to review how we uh, have lived the enduring truths and shown our constant face and how we continue to despite the predictions. Uh, and there are several reasons why it's unfair. Uh, it doesn't take note of other factors that prevent us from showing our constant face. Uh, one of them, actually one factor that ought to be mentioned is that everybody else in the world, every other power in the world is exactly the same, although the West perhaps win some prizes in cowardice and deceit. Uh, good education helps with that. Uh, but in standard behavior, if not for the, maybe not in the domain of self-adulation, but at least in behavior, uh, other actors in the world scene aren't all that much different. Uh, but more to the point here, we have to recognize that with the Cold War, true, the Cold War did end, but it was replaced right away by new and very severe problems uh, so that the enduring truths have to be put on the shelf a little longer and we can't yet show our constant face to the world. Uh, one of the enduring truths was explained by the Bush administration uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, uh, when they sadly informed the public and the Congress that there would be no peace dividend well, it's true that the Russians were gone. Nobody could pretend that they were on the march any longer. But uh, that threat had been replaced by a different one. Uh, the different threat was, I'm now quoting, the technological sophistication of third world powers, uh, which requires that we keep the Pentagon budget just where it was or even going up and maintain what's called the defense industrial base, which means the whole of high technology industry, and we also must maintain our intervention forces. Uh, the White House pointed out to uh, inform Congress, aimed primarily at the Middle East, which is where they have been aimed for a long time. Uh, recall that this was well before the uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. Uh, this was at the time when Saddam Hussein was still a favored uh, ally and, and uh, trusted friend. Uh, but we had to maintain the intervention forces poised towards the uh, the source of 
the major uh, uh, energy reserves of the world. Uh, the uh, Pentagon budget, in fact, has remained high. It's uh, now actually higher in real terms than during the Nixon years, about 85 percent of the Cold War average, and it's increasing. Uh, for a rational person, this fact gives some measure of the perceived importance of the Soviet threat during the period when we were supposedly defending ourselves from it. Uh, the point's obvious, so I won't expand on it. The Pentagon budget, as you know, is now going up. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, which calls itself conservative in some odd Orwellian usage, uh, is, uh, it has presented the budget which Congress, the Republican Congress, pretty much implementing. Anything, any government service that goes to people is down. Uh, but one part is going, actually two parts are going up. The Pentagon budget has to increase according to the Pentagon budget and, of course, the other component of the security system, the uh, imprisonment of the population, which is now taken off into the stratosphere, uh, that part has to increase too. Uh, Newt Gingrich, of course, agrees. Uh, and the reasons are explained. Uh, the reasons were explained, for example, by a spokesman for the aircraft industry for Lockheed, which happens to have its corporate headquarters in uh, Gingrich's district and just received a huge subsidy from the Clinton administration for the uh, uh, for having had to face the big problem of merging with Martin Marietta along with big subsidies for the corporate executives and so on. Uh, so an executive of uh, Lockheed Martin, the new merged corporation, pointed out that it's a dangerous world out there in which sophisticated fighter planes are being sold. So we're really in trouble. Uh, who are they being sold by? Well, mostly by us. We have about 75 percent of the international arms market at that time for the third world, and he pointed that out. Uh, executive went on to say, we've sold the F-16, the most advanced fighter plane. We've sold the F-16 all over the world. What if a friend or ally turns against us? So it's a real dangerous world out there. And there's an obvious solution to that. Namely, we should sell still more F-16s, but now upgraded ones, so the public should pay Lockheed and put money into the hands of Gingrich's constituents. We should pay Lockheed to upgrade F-16s so they're even more dangerous, and then we should do what's called selling them to the third world, which means giving them with export-import bank loans and other guarantees that are again paid for by the public. And having created a more dangerous world out there, uh, we then have to spend tens of billions of dollars on F-22s uh, in order to counter the threat that's created this way. That's the obvious solution, and that's indeed what we're doing, and that's why the uh, Pentagon budget is going up with a sort of a small point on the side. Uh, incidentally, the public is overwhelmingly opposed to this. The public is by about six to one opposed to increasing the Pentagon budget. The Pentagon is opposed to it, says it doesn't want all that stuff. Uh, but there's someone more important who does want it, uh, namely people like Newt Gingrich's uh, rich constituents and others like them who have to be protected from market discipline. If they had to face the market, they'd be out selling rags or something. But they need a nanny state, a powerful nanny state, uh, to pour money into their pockets. Uh, they happen to be there, represented by the country's leading welfare freak, Newt Gingrich. That's literally correct. Uh, it's not an exaggeration, and it's furthermore well known, although it's not reported. Uh, the uh, nor is the fact that the Pentagon system has long been the country's biggest welfare program, transferring massive public funds to high-tech industry on the pretext of defense and security. And that it is a pretext is also well known and has been public, uh, certainly in Washington, since the late 1940s. Uh, for example, when the Senator from Missouri, Senator Symington, an aircraft producer at that time, Secretary of the Air Force under Truman, uh, explained that the word to use is not subsidy, the word to use is security. Uh, that's the way you can get the public to pay the costs of high-tech industry, which cannot survive in an unsubsidized, competitive, free enterprise economy, as Fortune magazine pointed out, so that the government must therefore be the savior, as Business Week added, uh, and that's the role of the Pentagon, uh, providing 
what's called dual-use technology. That means military technology that can be adapted to civilian uses like computers and lasers and the whole rest of the routine. Uh, and in fact, the whole framework of the advanced industrial system rests on that technique of extorting money out of the public on completely fraudulent pretenses. So quite naturally, that major state intervention in the economy through the Pentagon system not only has to be sustained, but has to be increased. Well, uh, that's one reason why the enduring truths have to be on hold. We've got this big problem out there of the technological sophistication of third world powers uh, that we have to defend ourselves again, even though the Russians are gone. Uh, there's a second reason why the enduring, shelf, uh, the enduring truths have to be kept on the shelf for a few more years, and that is that although the Cold War ended, it was replaced by an unanticipated outbreak of ethnic conflicts uh, and other irrational violence and religious fundamentalism and so on, maybe even a clash of civilizations, one of the fancy phrases from Harvard, uh, and other novel uh, horrors. So we're still not free to show our constant face to the world. It's going to have to wait a while. Well, let's have a look at that, uh, starting with today troops going to Bosnia, uh, where they can be expected to uh, implement what's now pretty clearly in process, namely the effective partition of Bosnia between Greater Croatia and Greater Serbia, whatever it may be called. Uh, both of them, both of these surviving units, it is hoped uh, under Washington's guiding hand, as Croatia already is, uh, as part of the expanded Middle East region. The U.S. has always regarded that region as basically a fringe of the Middle East. Uh, and uh, in the Middle East, with its enormous uh, energy reserves, uh, the U.S. has always, uh, well, since the Second World War, has insisted on unilateral control. In part, this anticipated U.S. base in the Balkans uh, will also serve as a uh, f a kind of a leverage with regard to another prize, namely the fate of Eastern Europe. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, East, most of Eastern Europe is returning back to its being forced back, in fact, into what it always was for hundreds of years, namely a service area, third world, what we now call a third world serving the West. And the question is, who's going to pick up most of the prizes? And here there's some conflict. So the Germans have their ideas. and. American investors have their ideas, and they're not entirely identical. And the base in the Balkans gives a sort of a, a, some leverage in influencing that outcome. So that looks like what's going on there. Uh, the uh, U.S. troops in Bosnia are not uh, garden variety peacekeeping forces. In fact, they're not peacekeeping forces at all. Uh, for a good reason. Uh, the United States has, has an unusual military doctrine, possibly unique, uh, which disqualifies it from uh, genuine peacekeeping operations, that is, operations in which civilians are involved. So we're different from Canada or Ireland or Norway or Fiji Islands or other places that do send peacekeeping forces. Uh, the difference is that U.S. forces are not permitted to face any threat. Uh, if they sense a threat, they're supposed to respond with massive force. And that's unusual and perhaps unique. Uh, the, uh, that point was, uh, that's, we just saw that in Somalia, where the threat was very, very slight. You know, teenagers with rifles. Uh, but they ended up with, according to Washington sources, about 7,500 to 10,000 civilians killed in the course of that operation. And that's because of the U.S. military doctrine, which is unique and does rule out any U.S. participation in uh, peacekeeping operations. This is not one. Uh, that was made very clear when the announcement of the troops was made a couple of days ago. Washington announced that there will be what they called robust rules of engagement, uh, no more limits on the use of force, uh, nothing like those wishy-washy Europeans. Uh, the U.S. will use deadly force wherever necessary, the Secretary of Defense said. Uh, Anthony Lake added that if anyone fools with our forces, they will get hit immediately and very hard. Implication is pretty clear. They can commit atrocities if they like, uh, but don't fool with our forces. Uh, well, there's actually supposed to be a reason for this. 
uh, there's a kind of an official reason, at least in the doctrinal system, as to why the U.S. has this unique military doctrine. Uh, the reason is supposed to be the Vietnam experience. That's kind of interesting, an interesting fraud. Uh, the problem is that there's two stories that have to be concealed. Uh, story number one is that the United States attacked South Vietnam and then all of Indochina during the Kennedy years and then expanded it. Uh, that left three countries in total ruins with millions of uh, people killed and limited likelihood of recovery. Uh, that, all those facts are unspeakable in the United States, in fact, the West in general. Uh, the second point that has to be concealed is that the public opposed this and opposed it on moral grounds. That's, you're not allowed to know that. Uh, during the period when polls were taken from early 70s up to the early 90s, there were regular polls, uh, the people, uh, uh, when asked about the Vietnam War, opposed, about 70, roughly 70 percent, a very stable figure, opposed the Vietnam War as, I'm quoting, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Uh, well, well-educated folks understand that it was at worst a mistake, uh, but good intentions cannot be questioned. It could not be called fundamentally wrong and immoral. Uh, now, since the facts are completely unacceptable, we need a better story, and the better story is that the public opposed the war because of U.S. casualties. So, in other words, the public is just as rotten as the educated folks, the commissar class. Uh, that's the story, uh, and the same fanciful tales, incidentally, are told about Somalia and now Bosnia. They're clearly refuted by public opinion studies, but facts are one thing and enduring truths are something else. So the U.S. forces are going to Bosnia under robust rules of engagement and, of course, under U.S. command, called NATO, but U.S. command. Uh, again, that's a commitment, that's a, that's a doctrine that is unlike other countries. I know of no other one. Uh, well, these are all among the prerogatives of power and part of the uh, enduring truths uh, that uh, uh, are some of the real ones. Well, it should be mentioned that the Bosnia, sending troops to Bosnia is being debated, in fact, hotly debated. Uh, last Sunday, for example, take a look at the New York Times, there was a big discussion about it. Uh, the New York Times Asia specialist, Barbara Crosset, uh, she warned us that uh, uh, we ought to remember Cambodia, quoting now, barely alive after decades of civil war Khmer Rouge genocide and foreign occupation by the Vietnamese, uh, foreign occupation which incidentally terminated the genocide, uh, calling forth wrath and uh, punishment by the United States, punishment for those who had committed the crime of uh, ridding the country of Pol Pot. I might mention that, that uh, the Prussians of Asia, as the New York Times angrily called them, uh, referring to what is probably the closest approximation to humanitarian intervention in history, uh, but somehow isn't in the canon. Not that they did it for humanitarian reasons, but neither does anyone else, uh, but something that comes closer to meeting those conditions than anything else I can think of. Uh, well, uh, that's... Uh, 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 the uh, Crosset goes on. She stresses the difficulty of achieving the good intentions of the United States and its allies in Cambodia and points out that that's a warning for Bosnia. Well, uh, does anybody remember anything in Cambodia besides civil war, Khmer Rouge genocide, and occupation by the Vietnamese? Uh, does anybody remember, for example, uh, a six-year bombing campaign before the civil war, before the Khmer Rouge takeover, the heaviest bombing in the world, in, in world history of civilians, uh, which left 600,000 people dead, according to the CIA, uh, millions of refugees, about 100,000 people dying a year in the city of Phnom Penh alone in 1975, when the Americans finally left, uh, and predictions by high U.S. officials that a million people would die under any circumstances because of the devastation in the country that had been carried out during this uh, uh, heavily intense, uh, extraordinarily intense bombing of civilian areas. Uh, that was the first half of the decade of the genocide. Uh, the phrase is not mine, it's taken from the one, it's the title of the one independent government uh, investigation 
of the horrors of Cambodia by the government of Finland, the decade of the genocide, decade because it started in 1969 when the U.S. bombing began, uh, continued in 1975 when the Khmer Rouge took over and ended in 1979 when they were kicked out by the Vietnamese. So that's the decade of the genocide, but somehow the first half of it, the first six years of it, are gone from history. Uh, and incidentally, were remarkably little reported at the time. I won't go into that, but I've reviewed it in print if you're interested, and it's pretty astonishing. Uh, okay, that's out of history. But what we are warned about is just the parts that are allowed into history. Well, Crosset also warns about Haiti, uh, where our good intentions, she says, may be undercut by demagogy, poverty, and homegrown distrust homegrown distrust. These backward Haitians somehow distrust U.S. good intentions, uh, despite all the blessings we've lavished on them for 200 years, maybe bad genes. Uh, the point is elaborated by the Times leading uh, thinker, Thomas Friedman, same day, in a column called Think Haiti, uh, which, and he says, Haiti is a cautionary tale about the limits of our ability to do good. Uh, we did the right thing in Haiti, he says, but President Aristide has not abandoned his populist radical impulses, and he's dragging his feet on handing over uh, Haiti's remaining assets to foreign investors. So we've had to cancel uh, unpaid parts of the promised aid, since obviously we can't tolerate that. Uh, well, uh, he, Friedman goes on to say, we can't even be sure that we can trust the police in Haiti, even though they, I'm quoting now, even though they've been through, put through U.S. human rights courses, uh, as in Colombia and El Salvador and Indonesia and other paragons of virtue. Uh, like 100% uh, of his colleagues, Friedman refrains from giving us a little background about Aristide's radical populist impulses, which we thought we'd overcome, by returning him on a condition that he accept Washington's socioeconomic program, of which, which is public, though you wouldn't know it from the press, uh, the core element of it, the core sentence of the program on which he was restored is the following, the renovated state in Haiti must focus on an economic strategy centered on the energy and initiative of civil society, especially the private sector, both national and foreign. In other words, the rich families living up in the suburbs who supported the coup, their Haitian civil society, investors in New York City are Haitian society, but the people in the slums of Port-au-Prince or the peasants in the hills, they're not Haitian so civil society just the rich investors in New York and the wealthy supporters of the coup. That's Haitian civil society, and the renovated state must focus on their interests. And uh, Aristide's populist radical impulses are that he, though he did sign on to this, he apparently is dragging his feet on this forthcoming program a little bit. Uh, what the, peop the point is that the general population, the overwhelming majority of the population of Haiti, they're not civil society, just the rich there and in New York and Miami and so on, uh, the people who swept Aristide into office had a different conception of Haitian civil society, and that, of course, has to be beaten out of their heads. Uh, they also had an unacceptable concept of democracy. Uh, they uh, had this weird idea that the general public actually has a role to play uh, in the way affairs of state are conducted. Uh, that's contrary to two centuries of doctrine in the United States, uh, which uh, goes right back to Madison and the framing of the Constitution and is expressed in more modern times by leading Wilsonian liberals like Walter Lippmann, uh, who explained that the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, meaning the general population, uh, have to be kept out of the public arena. Uh, they can be spectators but not participants. Uh, and the Haitians, in their ignorant ways, didn't understand that, so they needed a few lessons in democracy. That's another unspeakable, enduring truth. Well, what Clinton's, in fact, done is to restore the situation prior to the free election of 1990, uh, which was a disaster uh, because uh, uh, the Democratic 
forces, uh, popular forces actually participated uh, and uh, got their own conception of socioeconomic development uh, and their own representative in power. So that had to be overthrown by violence. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, what the, the current program is that virtually identical to that uh, advocated by Washington's candidate in the 1990 election, Mark Bazin, a uh, World Bank official who received 14% of the vote, but is now effectively in power thanks to our restoration of democracy, at least his program is in power. Well, those are more enduring truths, uh, which you're not supposed to know about. Uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, Haiti, the most impoverished country in the hemisphere, uh, is still dragging its feet. It's among the few countries where people are actually struggling against these uh, uh, structural adjustment style proposals, which are also being applied to us too. Uh, uh, and that's a pretty dramatic fact and something, if we want to, the idea that we should go to Haiti to teach them about democracy is so ludicrous uh, that one hardly knows how to comment. We maybe ought to go there to learn something about democracy, but that's about the only relationship as far as democracy goes. Anyway, we're supposed to see this experience as a cautionary note about our ability. And what is our ability? Well, in reality, it's our ability to, de uh, to destroy democracy, to intensify miserable poverty and suffering, and to enri enrich Haitian civil society sitting in the wealthy suburbs of Port-au-Prince or in corporate boardrooms in New York. Uh, you're going to have to look pretty hard for the actual facts, which incidentally are not in dispute, and I don't urge you to waste your time looking because you won't find them unless you go way out to the margins. Uh, well, uh, I should say that honesty requires uh, that we recognize that there is a discordant note in this chorus of self-adulation about Haiti. So if you read this morning's New York Times, uh, there's an editorial uh, which uh, 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 this discordant note, I should say, teaches you, is worth looking at closely because it teaches you a lot about how a really well-oiled propaganda system works. So I'll start with this morning's New York Times. It condemns, there's an editorial, condemning the CIA for undermining Clinton's efforts to restore democracy in Haiti. So they are criticizing. Uh, they're referring to a, a report last Sunday on CBS, 60 Minutes, uh, which confirmed that the head of the terrorist forces in Haiti, FRAP, uh, uh, that's during the military coup years, uh, Emmanuel Constant, was a paid agent of the CIA. Well, the Times also reported that something similar had been reported in the press. Uh, namely, it had been discovered by and reported by freelance journalist Alan Nairn, uh, who uh, somehow remains unmentioned in all of this. Uh, but now the fact is confirmed uh, last Sunday in an interview with Constant on CBS over 60 Minutes. And there was great outrage uh, at this new exposure of CIA misdeeds. Uh, Senator Tom Harkin was interviewed. Uh, he was particularly shocked that the CIA should undercut the U.S. policy of opposing the military regime and restoring democracy. Uh, Clinton's ambassador, Lawrence Pizzullo, was amazed to learn that Constant's FRAP organization was behind the uh, <coughs> demonstration that had caused the that had caused Clinton to turn back the Harlan County, the ship that went into Port-au-Prince Harbor and then pulled out because of a demonstration, a uh, crucial event in the whole affair. And Pizzullo was equally, uh, uh, Constant was, uh, uh, he was also, uh, I should say that uh, Constant was also amazed at this incident, namely amazed that the United States had backed off in the face of a few dozen demonstrators who hadn't expected that. Well, the uh, CBS interviewer asked Constant, this quote, after you scuttled the president's plan to restore Aristide to power in this Harlan County incident, did the CIA distance itself from you? No, Constant answered, uh, eliciting more shock and amazement. Well, uh, let's have a look at uh, some of the facts that have somehow escaped the eye of the New York Times and the Washington Post and CBS investigative reporters and others. 
Uh, one fact is that Bush and Clinton did not oppose the military regime. Quite the contrary. Uh, the OAS, the Organization of American States, did call an embargo after the coup, but with it very, within a few weeks, Bush announced that uh, U.S. manufacturers would be exempt from the embargo. Now, that was called fine-tuning the embargo to help the Haitians in the New York Times. Uh, so trade with the coup regime continued, not quite at the usual level, but not all that far below it. Uh, under Clinton, uh, that trade actually increased, not much below the normal level. Uh, even training of Haitian military officers continued, according to Haitian church sources, right through the military coup period. Well, there's something much more important than that. Uh, the crucial element of any embargo, as everyone knows, is oil. And everyone in Haiti could see that oil was continuing to flow. And in fact, that the rich, uh, the Mavs family and these other rich coup supporters, uh, were building storage uh, tanks for new oil and so on and so forth. Well, where was it flowing from? Uh, well, we now know the answer. Uh, the answer is it was flowing from the Texaco Corporation, which had been explicitly authorized by the Bush and the Clinton administrations to ship oil illegally to the military junta right through the period of the alleged embargo. To be precise, Texaco was informed that it was illegal for it to, shift, to ship oil in violation of a presidential directive, but they were also told that they could proceed uh, without any concern for legal action or penalty. Uh, Texaco even went so far as presenting to the administration uh, its uh, plan to the Treasury Department. It presented its plan to evade the embargo by some legalistic trickery, you know, claiming some other subsidiary was doing it and so on, and asked whether that would be legal. And the Treasury Department, no, it wouldn't be legal, but go ahead anyway. Nothing will happen if you do it. Uh, well, are those facts uh, deeply hidden? No, they are not deeply hidden. They were the lead story on the AP wires on the day when every newsroom, everyone's eyes were focused on Haiti, including mine, the day before the US forces landed when every newsroom was focusing on Haiti and everybody was reading the AP wires, which were pouring out stories. And, and the lead story, which kept being reiterated and focused, was what I just said. Uh, uh, it said that uh, uh, the a leak from the Justice Department, which was then confirmed as accurate, uh, stated that right through the Clinton, Bush and Clinton administrations, we don't know exactly how late, but well into them, uh, into the Clinton administration, the authorization of illegal shipment of oil continued. Uh, that was the day before the troops landed, impossible to miss. Uh, in a free press, the headline the next day would have been, there was no embargo. The United States conspired with the military uh, uh, to uh, continue the terror and to block Aristide from coming in. Well, you know, like anybody who's interested in Haiti, I was watching the AP wires that Sunday and immediately picked up the story, of course, because you couldn't miss it. Uh, and I wrote an article the next day, but that's for a you know, alternative press, so it was going to come out in six weeks. And I therefore wrote it in kind of past tense. I described this story as if everybody knew it already. So I ref you look at the article, it appeared, it says, well, as you know, you read already in the paper six weeks ago, uh, such and such. Well, that was kind of naive. Uh, it didn't occur to me that uh, even this much could be suppressed by the free press, and I was wrong. It was suppressed. Uh, it's still very well hidden. Later, I did a database search on it just out of curiosity, and I can tell you the details if you want. Uh, but basically, it's out of history. Uh, what about the Harlan County? It's being returned to uh, you know this great demonstration that forced it to be uh, returned, which we now discover with amazement was organized by Constant and so on. Was that a surprise? Well, it wasn't a surprise to uh, New York Daily News correspondent Juan Gonzalez, who learned about the plans uh, at a Duvaliest rally uh, the day before the Harlan County incident. Uh, that was a rally, uh, a, a, ten, a meeting, Duvaliest meeting. It was attended by U.S. Embassy personnel 
and he published the story on the very day when the prearranged plans were executed, namely October 11, 1993. And in fact, it wasn't a secret from any other journalist to either, and it wasn't a secret from the CIA, and it wasn't a secret from the White House, and it wasn't a secret from Lawrence Pizzullo. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, the president's plan to uh, restore our esteem with the uh, you know, uh, the, the idea that uh, uh, did, did Emmanuel Constant, let's return to the, to the question asked by the 60 Minutes reporters, uh, did uh, Emmanuel, how did the CIA react after Emmanuel Constant scuttled the president's plan to restore Aristide? Big amazement, the CIA kept uh, helping him. Are they kind of a rogue elephant or something like that? Well, not as far as we know. What we know is that the White House scuttled the plans, or rather never had them, and we know that the media have been suppressing the most obvious and crucial facts, which they cannot fail to know, not only about the fake embargo and the economic program uh, that's being rammed down Haitian throats uh, as the United States proceeds to overturn the results of the Democratic election, but even about the specific incident of the Harlan County. As for the CIA, it seems to have served as an agency of the White House, as it usually does, at least as far as information is available. Well, let's look a little more broadly at this great plague of violence and ethnic conflict that's erupted after the Cold War and is forcing us to conceal our constant face. Uh, is there an upsurge of such violence uh, as a result of the Cold War? Well, that's checkable. Uh, what about the Balkans? Well, the Balkans is certainly post-Cold War, but post-Cold War doesn't mean result of the Cold War. In fact, it isn't a result of the Cold War or its termination. Uh, the, that region were, was a U.S. ally, virtual client. It was subjected to a standard neoliberal program through the 1980s, and that was a bigger factor in the breakup and the violence that followed than anything having to do with the Russian Empire. Uh, what about Africa, Rwanda, see? Well, that goes back decades. Uh, Burundi had similar massacres about 20 years ago. Nobody cared. Uh, no Cold War connection. What about Haiti? That's too ludicrous to discuss. Uh, are there any actual incidents that actually are the effect of the breakup of the Russian Empire? Yeah, there are some. Uh, Chechnya, for example, the violence and terror there is a consequence of the breakup of the Soviet Empire. But that's hardly a new phenomenon in world history that calls for deep thought from, uh, from intellectuals. Uh, the end of tyrannical rule and imperial rule quite typically, quite typically, in fact, without exception, as far as I know, leads to an increase in suppressed conflicts, uh, disarray, and often worse. So take a look at, say, post-colonial Africa or take a look at what happened in India and Palestine after the British Empire collapsed, or look at the French Empire in Algeria or Indochina, uh, ending up with a horrendous ethnic conflict, uh, but one that doesn't count because the aggressors happen to rule history in that case. Uh, the same was true of the breakup of the, French, of the Dutch Empire, horrible violence in, in what's now Indonesia. Uh, in all of these affairs, there was a Cold War element, as in anything, but it was pretty far out on the margins. Uh, the, uh, the real problem throughout is described pretty frankly in U.S. internal documents and even uh, elsewhere, too. For example, British Foreign Office records uh, commenting on what's called the fall of China in 1949. And they, the problem is, they say, that China is moving toward an economy and a type of trade in which there is no place for the foreign manufacturer, the foreign banker, or the foreign trader. And that's a problem, and therefore we have to do something about it, and that's the core element in the extraordinary violence that has followed the breakup of traditional empires. Uh, uh, the point is that, as in Haiti, uh, the Chinese didn't quite understand who constitutes civil society. Well, the most recent example of the breakup of an empire prior to the Russian Empire is the Portuguese Empire. That collapsed just 20 years ago. And that led to a huge outbreak of ethnic conflict in all throughout the place where there were Portuguese colonies, Africa and Southeast Asia. 
On Africa, I'll just quote, there's a lot to say, but not much time. Let me just quote Basil Davidson, the British historian of Africa, one of the most respected historians of Africa. He says, those responsible for the contra subversion in Africa will be cursed by history for enormous and terrible crimes which will long weigh heavily on the whole of southern Africa. Uh, he's referring to Britain and the United States, the leading supporters of South Africa and its murderous assault on the Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique right away, or as soon as the Portuguese Empire broke up, uh, according to the UN Economic Commission on Africa. Uh, more than a million and a half people were killed and more than $60 billion da of damage was done during the Reagan years alone. Uh, that's during the period when we were carrying out constructive engagement uh, and, supporting, and subject, being uh, subject to Davidson's comment. In Angola, that war continues much worse than Bosnia in the same years, but basically unreported because it's not very useful to point out that the worst killer and war criminal is a man who was hailed right here in Washington not long ago as a great hero and a leading freedom fighter. Well, that's Africa. What about Southeast Asia? Uh, there was a Portuguese colony in Southeast Asia, East Timor. And just 20 years ago yesterday, yesterday was the 20th anniversary, it was attacked in that case not by South Africa but by another one of our clients, our kind of guy in that region, Suharto, with decisive U.S. military and diplomatic support that increased under Carter. It's continuing until today, although the British have now taken over as the leading supporter of the worst atrocity since the Holocaust relative to the population, which is the only meaningful measure. The United States is still playing a major role, although protest here has put some limits on U.S. participation, uh, and it's caused the Clinton administration to work out some tricky techniques to evade congressional restrictions and so on as it's done in order to help uh, our kind of guy uh, continue his exploits there. Uh, fact is, by recent standards, including the standards of our own actions, the collapse of the Soviet Empire, while bloody, has been remarkably peaceful uh, as compared with other recent cases. These are the obvious ones. Well, what about elsewhere, say the Middle East? Uh, there, there's a bright spot, not just bright, but awe-inspiring. Uh, one of the grand successes in reconciling an ethnic conflict that goes back to the collapse of the British Empire, namely the Israel-Palestine Agreement. Now that's been the biggest international story by a long shot uh, since September 28th when the Oslo II Agreement was signed in Washington. It was a day of awe, as the headlines put it. Uh, it was, there was another huge outpouring of emotion and adulation uh, for everyone involved in the Day of Awe after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, a martyr for peace, in Clinton's words, a couple of weeks later. Well, the reasons for the awe are given by massive uh, newspaper coverage here and abroad. I'll just give a couple of headlines as a sample. Uh, headline, Israel agrees to quit wet West Bank. That's the Guardian in London kind of on the left. Uh, Israel and the PLO assign agreement extending Palestinian rule to most of the West Bank. That's Reuters, uh, repeated uh, in uh, internationally, Financial Times in London, newspapers here, and so on. Rabin negotiated the accord to eventually cede Israel Israeli control of the West Bank and Gaza to the Palestinians. That's New York Times. Uh, Rabin's thinking underwent a remarkable transformation from 1992, an astonishing transformation as he agreed to peace with the Palestinians. That's the New York Times. Uh, Rabin proposed walling off the West Bank and the Gaza from Israel. That's the Washington Post. Uh, his plans were inevitably leading to a real Palestinian state, not a Palestinian Bantustan, as critics claim that's the left new statesman in England. Well, that's a pretty fair sample from the U.S. and British press, so there's good reason for a day of awe. That's pretty impressive. Uh, the uh, accounts have a number of interesting features. One is that the factual assertions are not just plain false, but ludicrously false. Uh, if you look at the actual facts, you find that what happened is something quite different. Uh, the agreement 
breaks the West Bank into four zones. Uh, one zone is Greater Jerusalem, uh, which Israel has already annexed and taken over. And if you look at the New York Times maps, they've already ceded it to Israel. It's supposed to be under negotiations, but not according to the New York Times. It's part of Israel. Uh, that's a big area, you know, just what it is. Nobody knows because it keeps expanding. Uh, but the, the Israeli government, including the Martyr for Peace and his successor, Shimon Peres, have made very clear that it's going to extend uh, to, inc to, go ver to include Ma'ale Adumim to its east and to go virtually to the Jordan Valley, which Israel's also keeping, to, so essentially to bisect the West Bank. Uh, that's uh, one, air, one of the four zones. Uh, the other three zones, which are the only ones discussed, because this one's already been ceded to Israel, uh, the other three zones of, of the West Bank uh, do give some authority to the Palestinians, namely downtown Nablus and Tulkarm and a couple other cities. Uh, that amounts to, people vary in their estimates, something like 1 to 2 percent, maybe the outside, 3 percent of the West Bank. So there the Palestinian Authority has control. Uh, 70 percent of the West Bank, Israel has total control, unchallenged total control. In the, re in the remaining zone, which is on the order of 28 percent, uh, Palestinians have local authority, but Israel has over, um, overriding control, veto power. In fact, uh, veto power all in 100 percent of the West Bank and Gaza, according to the agreements that were signed. Uh, well, uh, there is not a word in the agreement about any eventual grant seeding of any control. The actual arrangements are precisely for scattered Bantu stands, as indeed is reported in Israel, and as Rabin's successor, the dovish Shimon Peres, very forcefully explained, not in secret, but to a gathering of ambassadors where he explained Oslo too, he said a Palestinian state will never happen, whatever the new statesmen and others might choose to believe. Uh, furthermore, all these plans are rapidly being implemented uh, with uh, increasing settlement using your tax funds, using U.S. funds with the agreement of the Clinton administration as the Bush administration before it. Uh, in return for these concessions, uh, Palestinians have to re recognize, and under Oslo too, do recognize the legality of existing and future settlements in the West Bank and indeed Israeli sovereignty over, in effect, any region it chooses to keep. Uh, well, that's the uh, great day of awe. Uh, what about Rabin's visions having undergone a remarkable transformation? Well, they did, actually. Uh, take 1988. At the peak moment of U.S.-Israeli rejection of any Palestinian rights, at that point, Rabin, then defense minister, called for Israel to, contrain, con to control 40 percent of the occupied territories. That's the traditional position of his Labor Party back to 1968. Now, he's now settled for only twice that much, uh, along with agreements that rescind all UN and other decisions about the legality of the settlements and Israeli rights and te to territories. So there's a remarkable transformation, but it just happens to be in the opposite direction. Uh, the, uh, 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 the same is true, incidentally, of West Bank resources. It, Israel's got to control them, especially water. It did sign a water agreement with Jordan, but in that agreement, Palestinian rights are completely ignored. Uh, and of course, the water in Israel is out of the discussion. Uh, the water in the Palestinian areas is, has been and will continue to be, as far as we know, overwhelmingly used for Israel itself and for settlements. That is, so that settlements can have swimming pools with green lawns and so on, while villages next door don't have water to drink. Uh, well, that's the great settlement, uh, the day of all. Uh, in fact, what happened is, uh, and the facts are not in dispute on this, take a look at them, uh, Israel and the United States, the United States primarily, have rammed through the most extreme rejectionist proposal that has ever been put forth anywhere within the mainstream political spectrum in either country. In fact, it's about the same as the Sharon Plan of 1981, the far-right Sharon Plan, as has been pointed out in Israel, I should say. So September 28th was indeed a day of awe. It was a day of awe for the rule of force in international affairs and for the power of doctrinal institutions uh, in societies with very obedient intellectual classes. 
Uh, and I should say what's particularly remarkable about this is the subordination of much of the world to U.S. propaganda in Europe and Latin America. Uh, p country intellectuals, countries, policymakers have literally forgotten what they themselves were advocating four or five years ago and accept by now the U.S. doctrinal system. That is very impressive. It does merit awe. Uh, uh, all of this becomes even more awe-inspiring if you look a little bit at the history, which has been suppressed to an unusual extent, actually an extraordinary extent here. No time to review it. But what it shows is, in brief, and again, there's plenty of material in print if you want to look, and it's not in the least controversial. Uh, the United States has, uh, uh, but it's totally unacceptable, so you know, you've got to search for it. Even scholarship suppresses it. Uh, in brief, ever since Kissinger's takeover of Middle East policy in 1971, the United States has led the international rejectionist camp. It stood virtually alone in the world uh, in rejecting a very broad international consensus, a consensus which Washington itself had crafted but then abandoned under Kissinger's influ uh, control. Uh, that called for Israeli withdrawal from the territories in return for peace. The U.S. has rejected that since 71. The U.S. then went on to flatly reject any Palestinian rights uh, and has continued to in order to block any peace process. The U.S. has had to repeatedly veto Security Council resolutions to vote alone or with one or another client state occasionally year after year against General Assembly resolutions. It's been forced to block diplomatic initiatives from Europe, from the Arab states, from the PLO, in fact, from everyone, and it won. It won flat out. It won on the ground, and it won in what passes for history, and that's a very impressive achievement, which tells us quite a lot about world order and how it's maintained uh, and how it's justified by those who benefit from good educations. Well, let me go back uh, finally, to the conventional story, I think there is a move from containment, but I don't think it's a move to enlargement. Uh, rather, uh, borrow another bit of Cold War rhetoric, it's a move from containment to rollback. Uh, there have been major changes in the international economy and in the world scene in the past 25 years, of which the end of the Cold War is only a small part, and they have indeed placed extraordinary new power, uh, new weapons, uh, in the hands of private tyrannies and the states that they pretty much dominate, they've enabled them to launch a very significant attack against democracy, against human rights, even against markets, if we look closely, and to roll back the hated expansion of democracy, human rights, and freedom uh, that has uh, been won in a long, long and often bitter popular struggles, and we're seeing that right around us here as in much of the world. Well, it's not the first such moment by any means. This has happened before repeatedly. Uh, this kind of end of history has been hailed by the powerful and the privileged and by their minions several many times before, always wrongly, uh, whether uh, in fact this claim this time around is right or wrong uh, is not something for us to predict because we can't. Uh, it's something for us to decide and to determine, which indeed we can. Thanks. Before Professor Chomsky answers some questions from the audience, it's my pleasure to present Christopher Hitchens, columnist for The Nation and Vanity Fair. Never one to shy away from controversy, his latest book, The Missionary Position, is about Mother Teresa, whom he calls a leathery old bat. <laughs> it's available at the book table outside, and we highly recommend it. Christopher Hitchens is an erudite, insightful, and fearless writer. He is a master of his craft who uses words with surgical skill to excise corruption, to lance the pretensions of the self-important, to perform verbal lobotomies on those with delusions of grandeur, and finally, to improve the health of the body politic. There are journalists who can expose and inform, 
and there are journalists who can move you with the beauty and the power of their prose. Christopher Hitchens is one of the rare people who can do both. And he does it with ironic humor, easy grace, and forceful elegance. We are pleased that he could join us here tonight. Thank you very much, Terry, for a fantastically generous introduction. Could I first ask all those who know that they are volunteers to start moving and block all the exits, please? Um, you know who you are. There are stewards and marshals waiting for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, um, you probably thought you'd already paid uh, to come here. And I know that uh, I haven't drawn the most popular straw in being the one who stands between you and Noam and the question and answer session, but the fact is that we at Covid Action Quarterly are quite old hands and have been in this business a long while and we're not about to let a captive audience get away that lightly. Um, we would like you to make a pledge, if you can, and we'll be passing buckets and baskets around for you to put money in or IOUs or checks or any kind of paper currency. Um, I don't know, for example, if I can just start the ball rolling here. Um, how many people here would put their hands up and admit that they pay for home delivery of the Washington Post? <laughs> That's quite a lot. I, I do it too. I reckon, what, $250 a year for that. I don't see why the government doesn't distribute it free, quite frankly. <laughs> 250 for, you know, for to have a great wadge of consensus dumped on your doorstep. Now, if you'll pay 250 and not really notice it for that, the newspaper that publishes Henry Kissinger as an op-ed contributor, the newspaper of which I.F. Stone once rather brilliantly said, it's a great paper, the Washington Post, you never know on what page you'll find the front page story. <laughs> that paper, who will put up their hand and say they'll give $250? They'll give the Washington Post equivalent. There you go, into the bucket it goes. Any more? Yes. Excellent. Any more of those? Well, you can keep, um, you can keep thinking about it. The offer is not, uh, it was not going to expire with time. Um, while you're writing your check or your pledge or your IOU or, or just tugging at, at your billfold, I'd just like to say a few things about our guest of honor tonight and about, uh, and about CAQ. I was rereading Norman Mailer's um, Armies of the Night recently, in preparation for an interview I was doing with him, and I came across the wonderful passage where Mailer is arrested in the March on the Pentagon and is thrown into the wagon by the police, who then throw in a member, a uniformed member of the US Nazi party uh, in along with him, just to show that the park police have a sense of humor. And as the sort of scene clears a bit, um, he mainly realizes that there's him and the Nazi and one other, a sort of thin, rather distant, spectacled, slightly Jewish-looking sort of academic guy. And he says, that it it's, turns out to be Noam Chomsky. And I, when we interviewed him later, I said, that must have been an amazing encounter. He said, yes, at the time I had no idea who Noam Chomsky was. But Noam, of course, was, was from the first days of the anti-war movement, not just on the day of that great march on the Pentagon, but on many other days, important days too, in their very front rank, taking the side of the victim, calling an aggression by its right name, calling people to the responsibility, the realization that in such a case of aggression, you're morally obliged to stand with the victim. And that contribution, I think, will be remembered. He's often pessimistic about the historical record. I nonetheless think his contribution on that will, will always be remembered as, as quite literally imperishable. He was also there at the funeral of Fred Hampton. He's almost the only white face, I think, who was present at that funeral. Uh, the, the victim being an assassinated dissident, victim of a national political police force, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He went all the way to Managua to offer his solidarity in, in practical and moral forms as a lecturer and as a, and as a friend at the time of the hysterical war of aggression waged against, uh, against Nicaragua by the Reagan administration. And he's also uh, incredibly helpful, open, willing, and friendly for the least person who wants to consult him for, for research and scholarly purposes. I, I recently felt I had to do something about the Charles Murray Richard Hernstein phenomenon, the bell curve phenomenon, where it suddenly discovered that the fault is not in the society, but in the genetic makeup of its uh, lower orders. 
And I thought, well, probably no one will have something to say about this. After all, he's studied the nature-nurture question rather intently, and I rang him up, said, what have you got? He said, well, I haven't got much recent, really, but I suppose I did write the paper about Richard Hernstein. Hernstein is really the author, the late Hernstein, rather than Charles Murray, of the bell curve, a few years ago, and he sent me the most, the most perfect and most prescient uh, demolition of Richard Hernstein that uh, it was possible to imagine. This was at a time when everybody in the country was reviewing that damn book, and where the book was getting a really pretty extensive free ride, and where none of these insights, and none of these findings, and none of these uh, uh, areas of contestation were alluded to at all by the supposedly scholarly reviewers. But you only had to contact the man himself and to, to be, uh, shall I say, without sounding fawning, um, enlightened. Um, Noam has been the victim. He's not himself a victim of self-pity in any way. and wouldn't say this for himself. But I can tell you, as someone who's followed it, that he's been the victim of a really unprecedented campaign of calumny and defamation, and a parallel campaign to silence and exclude and marginalize his contributions. His books go unreviewed in the major outlets. His letters, often in, written in defense against appalling libels, are often unpublished or are published in a mutilated form. I think he's born, under, born up under this with tremendous dignity and bearing and, and address. My Chomskyan syllogism, therefore, if I can venture such a thing, is that he has always been there for us, and Covert Action Quarterly will always be and is here for him. And so give generously. How's it going? Is there anyone who hasn't had the bag under their uh, nose yet? Uh, there must be some people at the front, I think. Um, all right, uh, let's see. I want to increase the tempo of giving a little. Um, if what I've just said doesn't move you or stir you, how much would you give to see Barbara Bush in the dock? Or, okay, or any member of the Bush family. Um, I'm offering you Barbara. Um, I had to review her ghastly book the other day. You can always do something, you know, however small. I had to review this damn book for a stupid tabloid, reading through, and she said that Philip Agee had given away the name of an American agent in Athens who'd later been assassinated and was morally responsible for this man's murder. And the introduction says that George Bush read every word of the book to protect her from... Uh, having made any mistakes or committed any uh, errors of fact. So I thought, huh. I rang Phil in Hamburg. I said, I think you ought to sue her. And he is suing her. And they've already admitted that they're wrong. <laughs> this is good. You want, anyone want the buckets back um, or write another pledge? Um, he's going to sue. He's suing her for several million dollars. Uh, the publisher's already admitted, and the author, that their guilt in the matter by changing this and excising the libel from the paperback. And our old friend Phil uh, stands actually to be vindicated in the American court. And she might have to come there and take part in it. I'd say, what's that worth to you? I'd say that was worth a few, a few bucks. Um, it's one of those things that cheers you up. Give generously, in other words. When, um, when Phil first started writing about this kind of thing, it amazes me looking at his book now, uh, the, the, the scandal that it caused. We had no idea. He thought it was bad. Phil Edgy helped us to find out how bad. But we... And he had not the least idea how bad it really was. It's since his revelations that we've discovered about FRAP, that we've had Jennifer Harbury's revelations of the collusion, direct collusion between the CIA and the death squads in Guatemala, that we've had brilliantly reported also in COVID Action Quarterly the account of the CIA's part in the arrest of Nelson Mandela, the original arrest that led to his, uh, his first trial and, and imprisonment, and the arrest of his wife, Winnie. Um, We've had the Gladio revelations about the plans for military coups in every Western European country in the event of crisis. We've had the Ames uh, fiasco where it seems the taxpayers were paying to have the United States disinform itself, thus, I suppose, cutting out the middleman. <laughs> and now the revelations that the crystal ball and stargazing faction is considered to be worth 17 million of anybody's money. I've always thought, one, often wondered why the Washington Post has an astrology column and a horoscope every day. Now I think I know it was code. They were talking to each other through the Washington Post astrology columnist. Anyway, think, think about that and see much, how much money you can part with. CAQ has always had the goods on the, the foul collusion between the national security state in this country and a network of dictators and psychopathic killers who are ready to rent themselves out to them. I have very often have been lucky enough to be able to recommend visiting journalists from overseas to, to go to the CAQ library 
to go through the archive, to write stories in the foreign press, that, the sort that you never see here. It's a, it's a service they're very proud and glad to provide, and I'm incredibly proud and glad to be able to recommend. Great satisfaction comes of it. So what's it, what's it worth to you, is my question, as I hope we can have one more go around. Perhaps I can pluck one more heartstring, rifle one more pocket, open one more billfold. Did you see in the Washington Post yesterday that Dr. Michael Mandelbaum, great foreign policy pundit, of the Brookings Institution has issued his final critique of the Clinton administration's foreign policy. This is one that not even Noam, I think, would have believed in his, uh, in his critique of our, um, our vulnerability to our own good intentions. But Dr. Mandelbaum really does say the problem with the Clinton administration uh, is, and its foreign policy is it's so compassionate. It is the foreign policy, says this doctor at the Brookings Institution, of Mother Teresa. Now, if you take my view of Mother Teresa, which is that she's a valet du pouvoir, that she's a servant of right-wing thugs in power and right-wing businessmen on the make, uh, and uh, someone li who likes to fool the poor, I suppose you could say that this was the foreign policy of Mother Teresa, but I don't think that was the implication about either her or President Clinton. But it is, I think, still, and perhaps no one will agree, that the benchmark remark about, uh, about how we are really much too kind, much too sweet, much too altruistic, and much too forgiving. I will close with a story that I hope Noam will forgive me telling about him. Um, as we all occasionally do, we had to go to the dentist not long ago, and the dentist said to him, it's okay, your teeth are in good shape, but you're grinding them rather a lot, aren't you? Noam said, no, I'm not. I don't, I'm not aware of grinding them at all. Well, said the dentist, I've heard that before. Um, actually, what's happening, this is common too, is you're grinding them in your sleep. Noam thought, maybe I am. His wife and great partner, the wonderful Carol Chomsky, agreed to sort of have a round-the-clock gnome watch, just to sort of see what's... He wasn't grinding them in his sleep. So they had a more intensive watch, and they found he was grinding them for a 15, 20-minute period every day in the morning while he was going through the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I would just, in closing, therefore, uh, recall for you the great closing uh, words of um, the late martyr of the movement, Joe Hill. Don't grind, uh, be like Noam, organize. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, your turn. Uh, I think there's some mics up here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, if you could d discuss uh, the current situation in Nicaragua and comment a bit on the split in, in the Sandinista movement and also the, uh, the follies of the Camorra government. Mm. Well, let me give you two versions of what's going on in Nicaragua. Uh, one of them was given by Hillary Clinton, who was down there on around mid-October. Uh, and I think she, she at least stopped at the airport. Maybe she saw something else. Uh, and she praised uh, President Chamorro on having, I think her words were, uh, reunified the Nicaraguan family and re I don't control it. On, uh, close your eyes. <laughs> I've been blinded for the last two hours. So. Uh, she. Uh, uh, praised them for, for, for revitalizing the economy and reunifying the Nicaraguan family, very upbeat. Uh, I happened to be there at the time. I have a daughter and grandson there, and I was visiting. And a couple of days before, about three or four days earlier, uh, the, there's an ultra-right newspaper, the newspaper of the business community, the big, glossy newspaper of the business community, La Tribuna, and they had had an article uh, which was a which was on a, a UNICEF report that had just come out, which I haven't seen reported here, uh, on Nicaragua, uh, which, w and their headline said, Nicaragua is mortgaging its future uh, and may be destroyed. Why? Uh, because 75% of families live in extreme poverty. 25% uh, of children suffer severe malnutrition. A third of children between six and nine don't go to school. Uh, uh, the country is collapsing and has been falling into total ruin since the United States took it over in 1990. So there's two versions. You can 
pick the version of UNICEF and the right-wing business community in uh, Nicaragua, or you can pick Hillary Clinton's version. Uh, in fact, it, you know, there are a lot of third world countries, uh, if you've been around the third world, where it is possible to sort of drive around and think you're in a rich country. I mean, in Cairo, for example, you can go from the airport to the fancy hotel on the Nile and, you know, some fancy restaurant and so on, and you'd think you're on, you know, Upper West Side Manhattan or wherever the rich area of Manhattan is, I don't know, or the equivalent part of Washington. You can do that, and Nanago is not one of them. You can't go two blocks uh, without seeing that the country is desperate, uh, without having your car surrounded by starving street waifs asking for a penny, uh, or seeing that, you know, the place is falling to pieces. Uh, and if you bother looking any further, you see that it's not impossible, as a few Nicaraguan environmentalists are fearing, that the country may be uninhabitable in a couple of decades because people are so poor that they're forced to go up and cut trees and there's deforestation in a relatively underpopulated and resource-rich area to the extent that lakes are beginning to dry up and rivers are drying up and there's environmental catastrophes and so on. And that's after a decade of whatever you think about the Sandinistas, no doubt, of rather significant progress by Central American standards, astonishing progress. Well, okay, you can take your choice about what's happening. Uh, I've already forgotten the second half of the question. Well, the uh, split in the Sandinistas movement. Oh, the split, split in the Sandinistas. Well, I mean, the Sandinistas I have plenty to answer for. Uh, the good thing about the Sandinistas, I, I was very critical of them myself, as some of you will know, right through the 80s, and we had plenty of conflicts. But there was one good thing about them, several good things about them. First of all, they didn't go around massacring everybody, uh, which by the standards of our colonies is already pretty good. You know, so they get a couple of points for that. Uh, secondly, they did provide space in which other people could do things. So if people wanted to carry out health programs or, you know, to make a school for the poor or a cooperative or something, yeah, they'd help them out and they could do it. Again, by the standards of our dependencies, that's unheard of. In fact, kind of hard to find here. Uh, but so there were good things about them. On the other hand, they were authoritarian and they robbed and they, uh, you know, did plenty of ugly things. Uh, the Right now, the party has split. Uh, split is a funny word for it. I mean, the, the, the official party, which has almost every, at least by the polls, that's almost all of the people who support it, is the Ortega faction. Uh, Sergio Ramirez, who I should say is a personal friend, uh, is uh, separated. He was the vice president. He's now running a, he's kind of, a, kind of like a mainstream social democrat. Uh, is got a separate grouping. That's the Sandinista split. Uh, exactly what it means in the situation of the country is very hard to say. Uh, you, it doesn't make any sense to interpret the results of elections in Central America for very well-known reasons, very well-understood reasons, which were pointed out years ago by Central American Jesuits. And that is, as they pointed out, that the culture of terror has domesticated people's aspirations. You just place people under repeated terror year after year, uh, and it domesticates their aspirations. They don't even hope for anything anymore. Uh, you've killed hope in the title of a recent book uh, by somebody who's here. Uh, the, uh, that, and that's, that's the great achievement of the United States, to have killed hope. So people just sort of try to find survival strategies. Uh, and uh, hence the results of elections are almost meaningless even when people vote. May I ask that you restate the question because these oh, microphones sorry. are not wired into the loop system. Oh, Thank you. I see. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll try to keep this, the question very brief. You alluded uh, uh, to the fact that uh, the U.S. has cut back on the foreign aid and cutting back to the U.N. because uh, the Cold War is over and they don't have to, to give the bribes out anymore. And uh, then you, you said you were going to... That's not what I said. Well, no, it's not We never exactly. gave bribes out. Right, okay, that's true. That's true. We always and, had the most miserly aid program. Right, that's true. But, and, and, but that it has something to do with the end of the Cold War, and that the domestic situation also has something to do with the end of the Cold War, you know, having to do with the fact that you don't need the labor movement anymore to, you know, to uh, subvert the labor movements overseas, and you don't, of course, you don't need the labor movement at all because you've got slave labor around the world and so on. What I wanted to ask is, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what you're going to talk about tomorrow for those of us who are going to be snowbound? Oh. 
didn't know about the snow. Uh, if you're snowbound, I'll be too. The question was, I was asked to repeat the questions. The, uh, uh, the, I think there's a little bit of misinterpretation, but let me state the question as it was stated, and then I'll try to deal with the misinterpretation, uh, maybe my fault. Uh, I, the questioner said that I had implied, or maybe said, that the end of the Cold War uh, has led to a cutback in U.S. aid because it's not necessary to bribe countries, and it's led to a attack on the labor movement because we no longer lead, need the labor movement to undermine labor in other countries uh, and other things like that. And then was asked for a thumbnail sketch of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow for those of you who are snowbound. That's news to me. I thought it never snowed in Washington. Uh, the, uh, first of all, I didn't say, if I, if I implied it was my fault, but I didn't mean to imply that these things had to do with the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War has happened, but I think that's a very minor factor in what's going on. Uh, these changes have been going on very dramatically for about 25 years, and they have to do with big changes in the international economy. Uh, uh, the huge explosion of financial capital ever since Richard Nixon dismantled the Bretton Woods system and the system of regulated capital, which is an extraordinary phenomenon, the increased uh, possibilities of globalization of production. I mean. Uh, there's a number of things that have gone on. It's true that the cold, end of the Cold War contributed to them. Uh, the end of the Cold War contributed to them primarily. Uh, here I think you have to think about what the Cold War was about. In my view, what, that's mostly misinterpreted. Uh, in my view, the Cold War was just a very overblown case of a north-south conflict. Uh, it's kind of like the U.S. conflict with Grenada, to go to the opposite extreme. But, of course, there's a big difference between a speck of in the Caribbean that you can't find and a sixth of the world. Uh, one of them you get rid of in a weekend, and the other takes 70 years. But the structure is quite similar. Uh, Russia and Eastern Europe generally were third world, deeply impoverished third world areas for the most part. Parts were part of the West, and they're going back to the West, like the Czech Republic and Western Poland. Yeah, that was part of the West, and that's going back to the West. Most of it was deeply impoverished third world countries. In fact, the original third world. You know, it started splitting from Western Europe around the 15th century, getting increasingly more deeply impoverished as the West began to develop and be its service area, kind of like the relation between us and Mexico or something like that. Well, there's some rules of international conduct. One major rule is that no part of the third world, is, or the south so-called, is allowed to strike an independent course. That's not permitted. Uh, they have a function. Their function is to serve. They try to serve, carry out an independent course, whether it's you know, fishing cooperatives in Grenada or uh, a populist program in Haiti or you, know, you name it, uh, you know, clinics and uh, health care in, in Nicaragua. They've got to be smashed because that's not permitted. Uh, when it's in a sixth of the world, even more. And in fact, the U.S. attack, the Western attack, began in 1918. That's when the Cold War began. Uh, the, and, and the Russia wasn't conquering anybody, whatever you thought about it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, there's a second rule of international affairs, and that is you better, it's bad enough to strike an independent course. It's worse to apparently succeed. Now, succeed means maybe not, you know, there's no objective measure of success. Success means succeed in a way which will be, which will motivate others to try to do the same thing. And the fear of Russia from 1918 right until the mid-1960s, and that's when our record runs dry. You know, we don't have a declassified record after that. But as, from 1918 right away until the mid-early 1960s, the great fear was that they were successful, uh, that they were, a dem they were having a demonstration effect that others would want to follow. And in fact, if you think realistically, that's not mistaken. Uh, people here say, look what a horror it was, compare it to Western Europe. It's true, it was a total horror. But to compare it with Western Europe is absolute insanity. You know? I mean, that's like saying that the Cambridge, Massachusetts kindergartens are a failure. And proof, ask how much quantum physics the kids know as compared with the ones getting their PhDs at MIT. I mean, that's not even insane. You know? Uh, you want to compare Eastern Europe and something, compa uh, compare it with something that was comparable before the, this, took, this took place. So say compare Russia and Brazil, or compare Bulgaria and Guatemala, or something like that. That's a sane comparison. 
And there's a good reason why nobody undertakes it. If you have a look at Brazil and Guatemala and the rest of them, you'll see why nobody undertakes that comparison. Except people in the third world who don't have good educations like us, they do make that comparison. Uh, and planners in the United States always made that comparison in the West, and they were afraid of what they found, that in comparison with what we're doing, this stuff looks pretty successful, and others are going to try to follow it, and that uh, Henry Kissinger had a word for it. Uh, it's a virus that will infect others. Uh, and uh, he was talking about Chile under Allende. It was going to be a virus that would infect people as far as Italy, not because Chile was going to conquer Italy, but because it would send the wrong message to Italian voters. Namely, you can vote for a social democratic system and maybe it'll work. And when there's a virus, you've got to destroy it and inoculate everything around it. Uh, and that's what we did. That's you look over that, that's basically the Cold War. Okay, it's over. Uh, so Eastern Europe goes back to what it was, uh, pretty much, you know, not 100%. Uh, but the parts that were part of the West are becoming part of the West. The parts that were third world are becoming third world. And that, is, it, that does contribute to these other phenomena. It means for, in fact, you read the business press, they're very frank about it. Uh, the business press, which is the best place to, you know, if you want to read the press, that's the one that usually comes close to telling the truth, uh, they tell you that uh, with uh, Eastern Europe now back in its third world situation, or to put it, let me quote from the Financial Times in London, the world's greatest business newspaper, uh, the, uh, as, with the impoverishment uh, and pauperization of East Europe as a result of the capitalist reforms, uh, the uh, Western investors can now move their production over to Eastern Europe and undermine the pampered Western workers who will be forced to give up their luxurious lifestyles. So now, in other words, not only can GM and, you know, VW and so on invest in Mexico and, you know, uh, Brazil and so on, but they can also do it in Poland, where they furthermore get well-educated, healthy, trained people, because this part of the third world did develop, uh, and they can do it at 10 percent the cost of the pampered Western European workers without any benefits. And incidentally, since none of these guys believe in the free market and never have, the free market is for others, not for yourself, uh, they insist on high tariff protection and, you know, subsidies from the government and the usual stuff that comes along with foreign investment. So in that respect, yes, it's another weapon in the hands of Western power uh, to undermine the pampered Western workers. So the, yes, the Cold War has an effect. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a, not a big effect. And it, as with regard to aid, it's virtually nothing. Uh, what am I going to talk about tomorrow? Well, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is the rollback on the domestic scene. Uh, I think it's going on. In every, uh, the United States is, in effect, being subjected to a kind of a structural adjustment program. It's being turned into a third world society. Now, it's so rich, you know, it has so many advantages. In fact, it's totally unparalleled. This ought to be by far the most richest if there's one hungry child in the United States, the socioeconomic system is a total catastrophe, considered given the, given the wealth of this country. It's not like other places. Uh, you want to know how wealthy it is? I'll give you just one figure. In the 18th century, 18th century, the life expectancy of Americans, that level of life expectancy was not reached by the upper classes in Britain until this century, you know, the next richest people in the world. That's one measure of the extraordinary privilege and advantages that there are here. Uh, and in fact, so we're being turned into a kind of third world society, but you know, it's the United States, it's not Haiti. And that's happening all over. You can't walk through any American city without recognizing a third world city, sector of great opulence, uh, you know, a large group of people, actually the majority who are suffering or maybe in misery, and a big mass of superfluous people you have to get rid of. Uh, uh, All Souls Church, wherever it is. Anyway, that's what I'll be talking about. <laughs> Professor Chomsky, it's an honor to uh, share again this time and space with you. As your greatest student, I, I had to inquire the technique of our intellectual endeavor. We ought to uh, review the responsibility of intellect, that is the uncorruptible one. Why have we failed to uh, persuade the majority at center to take the necessary action disengaging themselves from this ben, ben, uh, benevolent, not benevolent, but 
uh, benign and or um, normalization of evil, also as uh, known as uh, cultural relativism, that has historically haunted uh, our condition. And here's a case of in point: uh, Richard Rulings reply to your um, letter. Richard Rulings, W O L I N. You wrote well, a letter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he says, despite the considered political and cultural means at the disposal of opinion makers and politicians, most citizens remain contra uh, Chomsky, surprisingly capable of penetrating the veil of deceit and um, making up with their own minds. Um, then, so, so what if uh, all citizens are aware? It has not repression from the systematic mechanism of economic political control enslavers to the rich and the powerful mm -hmm. so the question is why you know if uh, why we are if I got it correctly why we're unable to convince the majority of people to look at things the way we think the world is and are the mechanisms of control so powerful that it can't be broken I, like I believe our, our technique ought to be uh, look at too and see yeah. see I don't agree with the assumption I think most of the populations on our side uh, in fact, I think the evidence is overwhelming about that. So take, for example, like I mentioned one case. The, I only mentioned one case, in fact, when I was talking about public opinion and policy. Uh, t I mentioned several cases. Just take the case I mentioned. One of them is the Vietnam War. That's a big issue. There has been, thir you know, by now 40, 50 years of intense propaganda about the Vietnam War, all of which says uh, it was a noble effort that went, maybe went wrong. 70% of the population says it was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Despite that massive propaganda, despite never having heard anyone say that, meaning everyone picked it up on their own somehow. Uh, take, say, the Pentagon budget, the one part of the budget that's going up. Well, the I'm against that, and so are the population by six to one. That's not a small amount. Uh, take, say, budget balancing, the big thing. You know, We're all supposed to assume and take for granted that you got to balance the budget. In fact, the pol political system is, is bounded. You know, there are differences. Some guys say seven years, some guys say eight years, you know. Uh, so that's the, and then you debate that in the political system, and the, you listen to NPR, and they tell you Americans voted for a balanced budget, and so on. Well, the, the fact that, here, here are the polls you got to look at a little bit carefully, because they're well crafted. Uh, there's one question asked for headline writers. And there's another question asked for people who want to know what public opinion is like so you know how to frame the messages in which you deceive people. And those are different questions. The question for the headline writers is, would you like a balanced budget? And most everybody says, sure. You know, that's like asking people, would you like your mortgage to disappear? <laughs> Terrific. You know, I like my mortgage to disappear. So you get a big high number. OK, that's for NPR and uh, you know, the editorial writers and so on. Everybody wants a balanced budget. Then comes the other question, which is for the propagandists who have to figure out how to frame this so people don't know what's hitting them. And that says, uh, would you like, that begins to ask the rational questions. Like, would you, wa would you want your household debts eliminated if it means giving up your house or your car or your children's education and so on? Well, then everybody says, no, no, I don't want a balanced household budget anymore. Uh, so when you ask that question, the same question, do you want the budget balanced if it means cuts in health expenditures or, you know, social spending or uh, environment and so on, well, then populations opposed by, you know, three to one or something, depending on exactly how the question is framed. So in fact, the population is overwhelmingly opposed to a balanced budget. Uh, now, you're not allowed to know that. You're supposed to think everybody wants a balanced budget. You know, Clinton, when he responds to the Republicans, says, of course, of course, we have to balance the budget. You know. OK, well, there the population again. And in fact, you, know, you could ask the question, who's right? I mean, there is a factual question. Is the population right, or is the whole political elite right? Well, you know, I think there's good evidence about that, and I think the population is right. But that's another question. Uh, in fact, let me just end with this. Not only do I think the populations are on our side, so, do, uh, so, does, con so does the right-wing Congress. Uh, so does the Wall Street Journal. They all think the population's are si on our side. And there's proof of it. Actually, my latest had an article in Covered Action Quarterly where I ended up giving some evidence about this. Uh, the evidence that I cited was uh, 
the pro there's a program in Congress called Defunding the Left. Okay? And uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal has big articles about it, how we got to defund the left. And Congress is pushing through you know, legislation which will defund the left. Well, take a look at who they've got to defund. And what they're worried, they say, is it's really terrible. The government's funding all these left-wing organizations. We've got to stop that. All right, take a look at the list. The top organization of the left that has to be defunded is Catholic Charities. The reason why is because there are priests and nuns who, for nothing, are going out and working with poor people to try to help them deal with the fact that they don't have any heating for their homes and to help in Head Start programs. So we've got to defund the left and stop giving money to Catholic Charities. The second biggest program is AARP, American Association of Retired People. You know, another big left-wing organization. Why, are, why do they have to be defunded? Well, they have to be defunded, it's explained, because they happen to have a program that's trying to help elderly people who are hungry uh, get work. Now, in fact, the Wall Street Journal had another article saying that 16% of the elderly are severely malnutritioned and many are literally starving. But AARP is trying to work out some kind of program for them to get some work, so that's another left-wing organization that has to be defunded. And so it goes on. In fact, if you have a look at it, it turns out that the left is everybody who is not pathologically insane. You know? uh, that's a pretty large number of people. You know? So in fact, they think the whole left is a, that, you know, that we won, you know, that we've got everybody on our side. And in fact, I don't think that's completely wrong. Uh, so uh, the, the, it's not that the propaganda system has you know, turned everybody into a raving lunatic. No, it hasn't. People keep their decent instincts, but they are very confused. I mean, the same people who say we should, in, the government should increase, you know, the government, the majority of the population says the government has a responsibility to help the poor, but another majority of the population says the government should end welfare. Well, you know, what's welfare? Well, helping the poor. And here's where the propaganda system has worked. I mean, it's convinced people that uh, we're giving away all our money, you know, we're giving all our money to foreigners, we're giving our money to black women driving Cadillacs and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that kind of confusion is all over the place. And people don't know what they want, they don't know what they think, but they know what their attitudes are. And their attitudes are pretty sane. Professor, you know? but you must admit that nothing, the situation has not changed. And matter of fact, what I do think you mean the situation worse. has not changed? Have not changed. You Since know, when? Since I mean, do we have slavery? Do Oh, in the form of Okay, so we, no, the situation's changed a lot. In fact, the situation's changed a lot in our lifetimes for the better. It's a much better country than it was 30 years ago, way better. Uh, and uh, that's a very important, a, a meeting like this could not have been held, inconceivable that it could have been held 30 years ago. And now it can be held everywhere in the country, the most reactionary place in the country with huge mobs and everybody's interested and so on and so forth. Those are big changes. And they reflect all sorts of things that have happened in the country, not because you know people were writing articles or reading books or anything like that, because plenty of people are organizing. And they're organizing because they know things, uh, and they're learning things, and they're contributing by their actions to other people learning things and so on. That has changed the country. And there's plenty of room for further change. You know, things go up and back, like now it's worse than it was a couple of years ago, but that's happened before too. 1920s were worse than now. Uh, so, okay, when you keep question? struggling. I, I'm a, it's my unhappy oh, duty sorry. to inform one, you that our contract one, calls for us to close down 10 minutes ago. So I'm, I'm really sorry. I thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you, Professor Thompson. and magazines in the lobby. You might want to stop on your way out and please remember to subscribe to CAQ and support alternative journalism that can bring you these kinds of events. Thank you. To order a video copy of this program for $29.95 plus shipping and handling, please call 1-800-C-SPAN-98. 
This week on America and the Courts, a profile of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Former appeals court judge Leon Higginbotham and attorney Stephen Smith, a former clerk for Justice Thomas, offer their views. America and the Courts, tomorrow at a special time, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific.